Today we move on to a new topic, reasoning. Reasoning is a topic that we've skirted around several times. We've noted that for a long, 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 long time, going back at least to the ancient Greeks, the ability to reason has been seen by many as the thing that signal, singles humans out among all life forms. <coughs> now it's 2016, we're used to the idea that humans are actually animals, and that we are continuous with all other animals and all other forms of life, but that has not been generally understood throughout history, and reason has very often been held up as the spark that distinguishes humans from all other animal <coughs> kinds, and indeed in certain theological systems that makes them capable of good and evil, of sin, um, and hence worthy of an afterlife. So there's a lot hanging on this notion of reason. If we view reason as a specifically human ability, we might take a different tack, not so beholden to one or other religious ideology, and we might say, well, humans reason, other animals don't, spiders spin webs, humans don't. So reasoning might be just like web spinning, it might be the kind of thing that this animal does that's particularly useful to it. Um, I'll let you make your own mind up on that, I don't have a view. Um, but I will want you to have your thinking caps on and to do some reasoning today. We're going to have a couple of worked exercises. And just to get you warmed up and make sure that you have your thinking caps on, we're going to start off with a bit of nonsense. Okay, I want you to clearly distinguish between reason and nonsense, because that's what reasoning is good for. This nonsense comes from Ambrose Bierce, a very fine writer who wrote The Devil's Dictionary, who described reason, or logic rather, as the art of thinking and reasoning in strict accordance with the limitations and incapacities of human misunderstanding. The basic unit of logic is the syllogism, consisting of a major and a minor premise and a conclusion. And his major premise is, 60 men can do a piece of work 60 times as quickly as one man. His minor premise is, one man can dig a post hole in 60 seconds. And his conclusion is, 60 men can dig a post hole in one second. And he concludes that by combining, uh, but the, he says, by combining logic and mathematics, we obtain a double certainty and are twice blessed. If you cannot see that this is nonsense, then there is something wrong and you need to wake up because you'll be required to reason in class today. This is complete and utter tosh. And I hope you can see that things go wrong in reasoning. We'll be concerned with that. The basic format here, though, that we start with some premises and move to a conclusion, is going to be very important. So maybe you've given up already. You said, no, I'm not a creature of reasoning. Okay, then go back to spinning your webs. Um, I don't know to what extent it's justified to think of reasoning as being that which singles out humans from all other species. One problem with this view, well, obviously there are problems that it's a theologically inspired view that serves to underscore what we call human exceptionalism and makes us seem so special. But, you know, we've got the benefit of having a theory of evolution and a theory of biology that allows us to see ourselves as animals, and most humans at most times in history did not have that. And as we've slowly woken up to the fact that, yes, folks, we're all apes, without exception. Um, we've kind of looked around and we've spotted things that actually look a bit like reasoning in other animals as well. It might come as no big surprise to see that chimpanzees are pretty damn good at reasoning. In some famous experiments done by Wolfgang Kohler, um, chimpanzees were given lots and lots of tasks to solve and they did pretty damn well. You can see on the left hand side a chimpanzee attaching two poles to each other to produce a longer pole with which to retrieve a treat. In the middle there, you see a chimpanzee stacking up crates in order to get higher building, as it was, improvising a ladder. That sure looks like reasoning to me. But maybe then humans are the best reasoners, and chimpanzees, because they're a bit like us, are just sort of so-so reasoners. Maybe not very good to get a D-minus in reasoning. Which leaves us with the problem of um, Betty the Crow. Betty the Crow here, uh, I think she's in Manchester, and she's a notoriously good reasoner. Here there's a treat. Uh, deep inside a tube here that she wants to retrieve. It's in a little basket with a handle, and all she has is a piece of wire, and this piece of wire is absolutely no good for picking up the basket. So what does Betty do? She takes the piece of wire, and she bends it using a stone. And now she's fashioned a hook. And the hook is most excellent for retrieving what was in the tube. Problem solved. 
Betty can do this reliably. She knows how to fashion a piece of wire into a tool to solve a problem. That looks a bit like reasoning to me. I don't know how you feel about it. As we become more and more aware that we are continuous with all other forms of life, we see these surprisingly uh, familiar behaviors in other species, sometimes very unrelated to humans, that make us think, hmm, maybe we're actually part of something and not separate from it. Now, an important thing to note about reasoning is that it delivers results, but it does so not by providing new information, but by working from what we already know. So reasoning itself doesn't help us in identifying our goals or identifying our problems. We have some knowledge, and we use reasoning to go beyond that knowledge to make new assertions, new statements. The syllogism that Ambrose Bierce was joking about there is a formalized reasoning structure that we got from ancient Greece. There's one with two premises, all men are mortal and Socrates is a man. So those premises are what you already know in some respects. And from them you can derive, in this case correctly, the conclusion that Socrates is mortal. So reason is not a means of arriving at truth. If those premises are wrong, reason won't help you out. Okay? If those premises are true, then the conclusion is true. But reason in itself does not simply deliver truth. That's a very important caveat. And we're going to distinguish two fundamentally different kinds of reasoning today. We're going to distinguish between what we call inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is very simple to understand. You've had a lot of experience. Every morning you get up, you walk outside your cave, and you look over to the east, and there's the sun coming up. And it's done that every day since you were born, because you've lived in the same cave all your life. It's reasonable, then, to conclude that the sun is going to come up tomorrow in the east. But it's not logically necessary. You could be wrong. You're going to say, but I'm not wrong. The sun will come up in the east. Yes, but you could be wrong. Maybe the sun will be knocked out of the sky. Maybe the earth will be cleared away for an interplanetary highway. You could be wrong. So reason didn't deliver you truth. Inductive reasoning is based on experience, your prior experience, and it's a way of projecting forward and making predictions into the uncertain future. If you don't see clearly that you could be wrong, consider this turkey. This turkey is using inductive reasoning. It's been fed every day since it was born, and today is December 23rd, and it reasons it's going to be fed tomorrow as well. Sorry, turkey, you're probably wrong. Um, so using inductive reasoning, we arrive at conclusions which are probabilistic. They're probably the case, and even if the premises are 100% factual, that is the experience you're building on, your stock of knowledge, is absolutely secure, your projection into the future is somewhat uncertain. And that contrasts with the, the business practice of deductive reasoning. People think of this as hard logic. And in deductive reasoning, we start with some premises and we arrive at a conclusion. The syllogism is an example of deductive reasoning. If the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. There's no doubt. There's no uncertainty. But there's also the slight problem that no new information has been added. If the premises are wrong, wonky, off, misguided, no amount of reasoning is going to help you with this. Now these are quite different forms of reasoning, <coughs> deductive and inductive. One of them is used in science and one of them is used in mathematics. Mathematics is not a science. There's a long question as to what mathematics is. It's its own thing. Science uses one form, maths uses the other. Which do we use in science? <coughs> Deductive. Inductive. Inductive is correct. In the other lecture, I got deductive as the first guess. There's only two options, right? <coughs> You often hear sentences in the popular press like science has proven X, Y, or Z. Scientists have proved something. If the word proof and the word science occur in the same sentence, you're in the presence of a category error. It's a mistake. Science has never, ever proved anything. Science did not prove that the Earth revolves around the sun. Science has not proved anything. 
the theory of evolution has not proved anything. Science is not in the business of proof. Science is in the business of making the best possible prediction, the most confident statements about the world that we can, on the basis of what we know, what we have observed. Essential to the practice of science is that it can be wrong. If you don't build that into science, you're not doing science. That's why science is involved with inductive reasoning and not deductive reasoning. Mathematics is the business of deductive reasoning. It's a very old practice, going back to the ancient Greeks as well. They developed such notions as theorems and axioms, uh, formal proofs, syllogisms, logic. All this comes from the ancient Greeks. They were quite brilliant. In mathematics, we start with axioms, and we have some rules for deriving new statements from those statements. The axioms themselves are statements or assertions. Axioms in mathematics are considered to have a rather abstract property. They're either true or false. That does not refer to anything in the world. If we have axioms, then if we assume that those axioms, we start with the assumption that those axioms are true, then the statements that we derive mathematically using things like theorem solving, they preserve that truth value. So if we start with truth, we end up with truth. We distinguish between true and false, but we don't know what anything is about in mathematics. Now you're going to say, but scientists use mathematics. Yes, scientists use mathematics as a way of thinking, as a tool. They use mathematics as a model, as a metaphor for the real world. And they use mathematical reasoning to derive confident statements that apply to the domain of mathematics, and then they go and test to see that they apply to the real world. They don't use mathematics to obtain proofs that pertain to the real world. We're going to start with inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, the business of making more or less confident predictions, this is just a simple observation about how we get by in the world. If the sky is getting it dark and it's cloudy, it's probably going to rain. That's inductive reasoning. It's going from a lot of experience to make a prediction, a projection into the uncertain future with some probability. Most of the time, our behavior could be described as if it was the result of inductive reasoning. It's up to you to decide whether that's an appropriate description or not. Here's inductive reasoning. If you don't eat something, you'll get hungry. Now, I know that you all regularly go out and eat, and you all regularly would probably agree with this statement, but I'm not sure that that actually describes any process that led to you queuing up at the food counter. Even more, perhaps, when you walk into a room, you flip the light switch, and the light comes on. Nobody's really surprised that the light came on, but one way to view this is that you walked into a room and you had a hypothesis. You were predicting into the future, if I turn on the light switch, then the light will come on. And you know what you did? Like a good scientist, you tested your hypothesis. You did an experiment, flipping the light switch, and that provided you with evidence. And then you evaluated your hypothesis in the light of this evidence. And guess what? The light usually comes on, so your hypothesis is confirmed. That's a bit of an odd way of talking about someone walking into a room and switching a light switch, isn't it? I'm not sure that's what's going on when you do so. Usually, of course, you assume that the light will come on. If you didn't make these kinds of assumptions, if you didn't confidently act and make predictions in a, in a world that's characterized by being regular, you'd be lost. You'd be entirely at sea. You depend on the world having certain properties regularly. Because of this, most of our behaviors that could be described like this fall apart a little bit because we don't tend to look for evidence that falsifies our hypothesis. You're not asking yourself when you walk into a room, is the light going to come on? You are guilty of something called confirmation bias. That means you're looking, you're, you're sensitive to evidence that supports your hypothesis so that you never actually question your hypothesis. You don't consider the alternatives. Now, in the domain of switching on lights, that's absolutely fine. You're not guilty of anything whatsoever. You're guilty of being a person who's occupying a secure place in a reasonably regular world who acts with confidence, and we would all be in terrible state if we couldn't make such assertions. But in the domain of science, and in the domain of law, and perhaps in the domain of religion, we have this problem. 
that it is necessary for us to be open to and to consider possibilities that are not in accord with what we believe. believe. Here, confirmation bias is a real problem. If you don't consider things that violate your beliefs, that go against what you are assuming in your hypotheses, then, well, you're a poor scientist, a bad judge, <coughs> and a credulous religious believer. So it's not just in science that we have this. In a courtroom, it's very, very important that alternatives be considered. That when someone asserts something, that we be open to the possibility that evidence might prove that false. Religion is, I'm going to back away from that one slowly and say I'm not going there. But in science and in law, we have this big problem. There's a scientist who published a paper on confirmation bias. It only proved what I already know. This business of confirmation bias, that you are loath to, even blind to evidence that might contradict your beliefs, is a way of talking about something that we're also familiar with, which is stereotypes. Here's an ad that plays on this. It's an ad that's seeking recruitments for nursing. And it says, are you man enough to be a nurse? And it's playing on the stereotype that all nurses are female, something which we all, if we think about it, we know to be false. But if I asked you to imagine a nurse, you would probably have imagined a female. Let me confess at this point, I'm a nurse. Long time ago. Big story. Um, so not all nurses are female. Um, but is confirmation bias the best way to describe this? Because it sounds like a sin, doesn't it? <laughs> Coming back to that religion, it sounds like you just made a mistake if you exhibit confirmation bias. Well, let's take another case that we are familiar with because we met it. Remember Skinner's superstitious pigeons? These were pigeons who were kept starved in their boxes, and they have food delivered at occasional time, at random times, and they develop stereotypical behaviors. Notice the word stereotype coming back in here. They end up displaying these weird stereotype behaviors. <coughs> and we can understand this if we think of the pigeon as a reasoning animal. Here's the reasoning that I consider might account for this. The pigeon is there going, man, I am hungry. I would kill for some food. Food arrives, whoops. How did I make that happen? Pigeon, of course, knowing it's in charge of the universe, says, how did I make this happen? It goes, it reasons thusly, okay, I was bobbing my head before this arrived, therefore I will continue to bob my head, and Pigeon continues to bob its head. No food arrives for a while, Pigeon displaying confirmation bias. When food eventually randomly arrives, Pigeon goes, gotcha, I nailed this one, I can make food arrive, and so carries on exhibiting this behavior. Now, if you think that's what's really going on in pigeons' heads, you, we, we have a different understanding of what a pigeon is. We've noted the role of language in thinking, and I don't think you could reason in the fashion that I just did unless you were a creature endowed with language. Notice, however, it provides a perfectly adequate behavioral account of what the pigeon is. It gives you a story to tell that maybe satisfies you as to why the pigeon is displaying this weird stereotype behavior. So just because we can describe something as exhibiting confirmation bias, let's hold off on the moral approbation on saying that you've done it badly, because there might be another story to tell as well. Okay, you have your thinking caps on, you're all warmed up, we're going to play a game now. This was devised by a scientist called Wason. Here are three numbers, two, four, six. These numbers conform to a general rule that generates number triplets, sequences of three numbers. Your goal is to figure out that rule, and the way we're going to play this game is you're going to call out sequences of three numbers, and I'm going to tell you whether they conform to the rule <coughs> or not. On the basis of this, you're going to find out what the rule is. Off we go. Eight, ten, twelve. Eight, ten, twelve. Thank you. That conforms to the rule. 14, 16, 18. Thank you. That conforms to the rule. 15, 4, 15, 4, 3. That does not conform to the rule. Thank you very much. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. That conforms to the rule. Any guesses? 3, 6, 9. 3, 6, 9. That conforms to the rule. Any guesses? 3, 6, 8. 3, 6, 8. That conforms to the rule. Any further guesses? 8, 10, 9. 8, 10, 9, that does not conform to the rule. Anyone want to guess what the rule is? Increasing. Increasing numbers. 
Increasing numbers is the rule. Correct. Notice how many of these were suited to falsify or to test that hypothesis. I was very surprised when this came up in second place. Usually it takes about 10 goes before someone suggests something that might violate the rather obvious pattern of evenly spaced increasing even numbers. Notice 8, 10, 12 doesn't get away from this. It doesn't test any reasonable hypothesis you might have. It looks for confirmation of the hypothesis. This looks for confirmation of the hypothesis. These all seem to me to be looking for confirmation. It's only this and this one that seem to test anything, really. So, therefore, you're all lousy reasoners. We just had 15 minutes on the topic of confirmation bias. The very first test that comes along, you all fall flat on your faces. You're not even human. You can't reason, right? Go back to spinning webs like spiders. Now, I don't think that's a really fair way of, of judging this. Here's a little bit of slide on the text. This is for your revision purposes. It just describes what we just did. But notice that it says that 28% of participants, when this was first done, and the subjects were, as usual, in psychology experiments, a lot of university students, 28% couldn't do it at all. What people generate are sequences that don't test anything, but that confirm their hypothesis about what's going on. So much for that, but I'm not happy with that conclusion, just as I'm not happy with describing the pigeons as ex exhibiting confirmation bias. Because, and there's been a lot of discussion in the literature as to whether this is really the most satisfactory account of what's going on. For example, it, one thing that this misses is the fact that 2, 4, 6 is a highly regular sequence that exhibits a very, very precise, specific pattern. Another way of looking at what humans are is pattern recognizers. We are insanely good at recognizing patterns. Hell, we hallucinate patterns. Give us enough drugs and we see patterns in everything. We see patterns in the sky. We see patterns in numbers. We are pattern generators. And there's a pattern to be seen here. And people were correctly working on the basis of that pattern and cautiously moving out from it, not leaping to the wildest of conclusions. So you could say that 8, 10, 12 preserves the pattern but moves it to a new domain, so that's a cautious test. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way of looking at this, and I don't think you're lousy reasoners. Okay, that was proof by induction. You've really been tested for your humanity here today, aren't you? Okay, here's a little, um, little confusing note just to throw in before we move into deductive reasoning. In school, many of you, in those of you who did higher level maths, would have met something called proof by in induction. Anyone remember proof by induction? You either get it or you don't, you like it or you hate it. It's a very powerful means of proving mathematical statements. Here's an example of proof by induction. The statement to be proved is there is no biggest number. And we do it in two ways. First of all, we, we find a concrete case, one. One is not the biggest number because two is bigger. Okay, we can all agree on that. Then we have form a means, we, we, we have a, a procedure which says, if I have a number n, and this is not the biggest number, then n plus 1 is also not the biggest number. That happens to be true, because to any number, if I add 1, I get a, a larger number. Put these together, and the method of proof by induction says you've now proved, for an infinite amount of numbers, that there's no biggest number. If that just went whoosh, I don't care, we're not here to, 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 to do mathematics, okay? Proof by induction and so The reason I mention it is because that's deductive reasoning, not inductive reasoning. Oh, God. I wish they'd called it something else. It's going from what you already know and projecting forward. It's a bit like inductive reasoning, but it's actually, it actually lies within the domain of mathematics. Proof by induction is, unfortunately, because it's in the domain of mathematics, it's a form of deductive reasoning. I've been teaching this course for a long time. I only noticed that last year that there was that confusion, because people say it came up in an exam. Now we're going to move in and look at deductive reasoning, this kind of mathematical reasoning. Don't worry, we're not doing any hard maths. It's all fairly basic stuff. Here's a penguin to guarantee that you can get the hang of things. Penguins are black and white. Some old TV shows are black and white. Therefore, penguins are some old TV shows. Things can go sorely wrong in deductive reasoning, right? Um, oddly enough, it's a much better studied domain than inductive reasoning, and there are some very practical reasons for this. Inductive reasoning takes time. You need to develop a lot of experience with something before you'll be willing to commit to a prediction. And you're always making these probabilistic statements. It's not black or white, right or wrong. You're always saying something with a certain amount of confidence, a certain amount of uh, conviction. Even in that 2, 4, 6 task, you're never sure you've got it until you actually someone tells you, yep, you got it. 
Deductive reasoning is much simpler because in deductive reasoning tasks there's the right answer and the wrong answer, and we can look to see did you get the right answer or did you get the wrong answer. It's maths, folks. Sums have right answers. When we do reasoning in this sphere, very often we're starting with propositions to which we assign a truth value. And then from those propositions, we call premises, we move to a conclusion. And if the premises were true, then the conclusion will also be true. That business of drawing conclusions is the business of logical reasoning. Uh, so we'll encounter statements like, if something, then something else. That's going from what you know to something else. If and only if and so on. We're going to actually keep this very, very simple. And although there's a lot of machinery in the world of logic, we're going to keep it really simple and stick to the smallest little, simplest kinds of reasoning. We're going to deal with propositions which we'd assume are either true or false. Okay? We're not talking about the real world here. We're talking in a mathematical sense. If you have a statement, it's either true or false. This is a bit like a sentence, but sentences in the real world, as we know, don't function like that. If I say, how are you, that, that, that's not true or false. Even if I say it's a grand day today, that's not true or false. It's, my, it's an opinion. <laughs> you know. Here we'll say that it's a proposition is something to which we can confidently assign either the value true or false. And then given several propositions, in fact, we'll work with given two other two propositions. We'll um, test to see whether a third proposition can be said to be true or false. This is really, really simple. Um, we're going to see the same pattern repeated a few times, but don't fall asleep because there's some surprises hidden in here. The first reasoning example is a, a form of reasoning known as modus ponens. Really mad, difficult Latin title for what is the simplest kind of reasoning known to mankind. <laughs> Our first proposition is itself complex. It contains two mini miniature embedded propositions, if P, then Q. For example, if Socrates is a man, then he is mortal. So those letters P and Q here, they're standing for whole propositions themselves, but I'm not asserting them. The proposition that I'm asserting is that if P is true, then Q is true. That's my first proposition, my first premise. And the second one then asserts that P actually is true. And in the example, you can say Socrates is mortal. <gasps> well, given the first one, if Socrates is a man, then he, sorry, if Socrates, sorry, if Socrates is a man, then he's mortal. That's my first one. Socrates is a man. You don't have to be Einstein to figure out that he's mortal, right? Everyone can do that. It's screamingly obvious. It hardly needs mentioning that if the first two are true, then the last one is true. Notice the form. The first premise is if P, then Q. The second one is P, and from that we derive Q. It looks so simple, you wouldn't think you could get it wrong. Ha! Here's something very, very similar, which people find, for some reason, much more difficult. The first proposition in modus tollens is the same, if P, then Q. The second proposition, though, is different. It says not Q. It's not the case that Q. So my example here is, the first one is, if there is fire, then there's oxygen. And the second statement is, there is no oxygen. There's not oxygen. From that, we can deduce that there's not a fire. If, the first, if both of those premises are true, it is clearly true, is necessarily true, that we can conclude there's no fire. Does everyone get that? You can conclude not P. There they are together, and they look like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. There's a slight difference between them. People tend to find modus tollens harder than modus ponens because you've got these negations in there. This not business. It confuses people. So we've met two very simple forms of reasoning. Let's try some reasoning ourselves. If Susan is angry, then I'm, I'll be upset. I'm upset. Therefore, Susan is angry. Who thinks that's modus ponens? Nobody. Who thinks that's modus tollens? Few people may be uncertain. It's neither. If P, then Q. P here is Susan is angry. Q is I am upset. But then we are asserting Q. That's not, let's go back. For modus tollens, we had not Q. 
for modus ponens, we had P. Here we're asserting Q. Notice, stop thinking in terms of P's and Q's here. Suppose it's true that any time Susan is angry, I'm upset. It absolutely is true, okay? It's just, just a God-given rule. And now you find me and I'm upset. Guess what? Susan's happy as Larry. It's just that my budgie died and I spilled the porridge and I'm having a bad day, so I'm upset. I could be upset for all kinds of reasons. And there's nothing in those first two premises that asserts that Susan being angry is the only reason that, I'm upset, that I could be upset. So this is an example of a logical fallacy. It's something that looks like logical reasoning, but it goes badly wrong, like our penguin at the start. This particular one has a name. If P, then Q. Q. It's called affirmation of the consequent. Why does it have that weird name? They all have weird names, don't they? Well, in each case, we've got this if P, then Q structure. P, we're going to call the antecedent. We'll come to it in a minute. Q, we're going to call the consequent. So that the second premise here is affirmation of the consequent. We're saying Q. If we therefore deduce P, then we've made a mistake. Even though it looks valid, it's not valid. And a few real-world real world examples make this very clear. If I do well on the test, I will get drunk at the weekend. Suppose that's true. And you also find out I got drunk at the weekend. You're not going to conclude that I did well on the test. I tell you, if I do badly on the test, I'm going to get double drunk on the weekend. Right? That's perfectly obvious. So this is a logical fallacy. And it's not... The problem is that in... Affirming the consequence, affirming, asserting Q, you're saying nothing about P. There's no logical connection. P implies Q, but Q does not imply P. It's, there's the directionality to this. The second one we've had, we, we'll find, the second fallacy, fills out a, an array here of four logical forms. Each one starts with if P, then Q. We've had P, we've had not Q, we've had Q, so the last one is not P. This is called denial of the antecedent. P is the antecedent. And so our second one is denial of it. It means not P. If we conclude from that not Q, we've made a mistake again, even though it looks like logic. So we've got to be careful here. Real world example, please, or I'm going to lose my, my all sense. OK, if I do well in the test, I will get drunk. I fail the test. Therefore, I will not get drunk. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Right? No, there's no, no reasonable grounds, if the first two statements are true, to conclude the third statement. You can see, I hope, that this too is a fallacy. Everyone's an expert now in reasoning in these four little forms. In each case, we start with if P, then Q, and we have a second premise, and then we deduce something. Here they are all listed together. And just to keep you thinking, I've replaced P and Q with A and B. I hope you can survive the shift. Okay? They all start with if A, then B. A is the antecedent, B is the consequent. Modus ponens asserts A, and we can correctly conclude B. Modus tollens says not B, and we can correctly conclude therefore not A. The two fallacies are when we observe that B is true and we conclude therefore A, that's not true, that's affirming the consequent, or if we say not A, and we therefore conclude not B, that's also not, not rational. So reasoning is difficult, man. It's really difficult. And there's been various tests done to test this, but we're going to move straight on to an exercise for you guys. Okay, everyone's got their hat on. Here's a rule. Every card has a letter on one side and a number on the other side. Just assume that, okay? Here's a rule. If there's a vowel on one side, then there's an odd number on the other side. Which cards do I have to turn over to test that rule? I'll give you 20 seconds to make up your minds, and don't change them after that, just to be fair. Mine's made up. Okay, who votes we have to turn over a card, the card with A on it? Okay, that's the Fianna Fáil crowd. Who votes we have to turn over D? <coughs> okay, that's Renua. We've got a couple of votes. <laughs> who votes we have to turn over 4? 
Mm, this is the Labour Party. Okay, who votes we have to turn over seven? Mm, that's Fine Gael, maybe. Okay. So every card got votes. Now, we just went through four reasoning scenarios, and actually each one of those cards corresponds to one of those reasoning scenarios. The rule is if, val, then, odd. Right? So let's consider each of the cards here as a proposition. The first one is A, has a vowel on it. So this is, if P, then Q, P. So we know that the card with A on it has a vowel on it. If we turn that over and we find an even number, then our rule is false. So we have to turn over that card. So everyone who voted for A, pat yourself on the back. You're half divine. You're a human gifted with the spark of true reason. D is not a vowel, so this is the equivalent of not P. And if it's, if, if it's true that if a vowel then odd, we find something that's not a vowel, then we know nothing. We can make no prediction whatsoever. There's no need to turn over this card, because it doesn't matter what's on the other side. It's going to be irrelevant for our rule. So all those of you who voted to turn over D, so there was very few, that was the Ray Nua. Uh, you did as well as Ray Nua, for Egypt, which has just been demoted from angel to human again. Okay? Four. Well, that's odd, so that's Q. No, that's not odd. Four is not odd. I'm not a very good reasoner either. Four is even, so that's not Q. This corresponds to modus tollens. And in fact, we do have to check, because if we have a card with four and we turn it over and there's a vowel on it, our rule is false. So this was the Labour Party. Four didn't get many votes, but you have to turn over four. Not doing too well. And seven got quite a few votes, but I think about it, it's an odd number, but if we turn it over and we find a vowel, our rule is fine. If we turn it over and we find a consonant, our rule is also fine, because our rule only said something about cards with vowels on them. So you all failed again. So the whole point of this lecture is to convince you that you're not human, that you can't reason your way out of a wet paper bag. Here's the four going down there. There's modus ponens, is the A. The seven is modus tollens. No, the four is modus tollens. The seven is the affirmation of the consequence. And the D is denial of the antecedent. You can go through those in your own time. So I'm not happy, though, again, with this business of me calling you out. I failed as well. Right? I get them confused, and I get mixed up. When you give this test to a bunch of bright university students, about 5 to 10% of them get it right, always. If we give exactly the same test, but we move it from the domain of abstract reasoning to the domain of concrete reasoning, it's a whole lot easier. Suppose we had a rule that, let's make up an arbitrary rule, if you're under 18, you're not to drink alcohol. Right? That's a rule some of you here might be familiar with. Now imagine yourself, you're, you're a guard, right? You walk into a bar, and you see some people drinking, and you want to check them. If someone's drinking a Coke, do you check them? Who cares? If they're drinking a beer, you better check their ID. If they're 16 years old, you better check they're not drinking a beer. If they're 20 years old, who cares what they're drinking? Not one of you would have made one error on that. I'm not going to insult your intelligence and suggest you couldn't deal with the practical situation of checking the legality of drinking in a bar. Honest to God, I don't have to do it. 100% of you would have got 100% of those right. Here's an important insight. Okay? Meaning really matters. You were reasoning about an abstract rule in an abstract domain that you, didn't, you had no skin in the game, as it were. You didn't really care about vowels and odd numbers, I presume. So you did pretty bad. Shift it into a domain that you're familiar with, and I assume some of you have encountered something like that rule before, and you all do brilliantly. Well, that's deductive reasoning for you. We can view it, on the one hand, as an abstract, symbolic, highly intellectual kind of pursuit. That would be the rationalist way of coming at things. That is the rationalist picture. And reasoning has long been the principal concern of rationalists. The word ration, rational is in there, in the term rationalist. If we connect it to the real world, though, if we connect it to the world of everyday experience, we develop some empiricist concerns. Then we find that we do much better. Interesting. 
Now, we just exhaustively went through these four kinds of reasonings using this template, if A, then B, with a second premise, which varied from case to case. That's only the starting point for logic. Logic gets much, much more complex. We're not going to do this. But the syllogisms that Ambrose Bierce was taking fun of are built up from more complicated parts than if A then B. So we have all somethings, no something, some somethings, are and not. If we allow just these extra quantifiers, we can end up with things like all Frenchmen are cheese eaters, all cheese eaters are surrender monkeys, therefore all Frenchmen are surrender monkeys, if we let Groundskeeper Willie do our reasoning. Um, but there's not four combinations now. With these extra pieces, there's 512 different combinations. And people are going to make all kinds of errors here, as you can see. So here's one. All French men are cheese eaters. Some cheese eaters are farmers. Therefore, some French men are farmers. Is that valid or is that invalid? Well, if you think about it a lot, you'll realize it's invalid. It's, it's, it's nonsense reasoning. But what you see is that reasoning is really difficult if we regard it as this kind of deductive enterprise where we always have to come up with a right or a wrong answer. So is any of this any use in the real world? We're going to finish up today on a poem, unusually. A poem by Andrew Marvel to his coy mistress. And I'm not going to spoil anything when I say that the plot of the poem is to get the lady in the sack. Okay? He's trying to convince her to go to bed with him. He does it rather well. He creates an argument which has premises and he draws a conclusion. We're just going to look at his logic. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. That's the premise. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Did I mention Andrew Marvel's a rather good poet? And here's the conclusion. Now therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every poe with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may. What he means is get in the sack. So his, his premise is, if we had all the time in the world, then we could be coy and just hold hands and talk about poetry and all this kind of nonsense. His second conclusion is, but we don't have all the time in the world. Not P. Right? This is denial of the antecedents. And he concludes, therefore not Q. Therefore we can't hang on. Therefore get in the sack. If anyone ever tries this on you in a bar, just laugh at them because they're committing a logical fire and say, that's Denial of the antecedent, you fool. Okay, and you get out of it that way. Okay, we'll finish up there. See you all on Thursday.